Good morning. My name is Ravi Velour, and I'm an associate editor of The Straits Times in Singapore. Uh, we're very pleased to partner with uh, WEF for this session, uh, battling over Asia's economic architecture. Uh, we're meeting at a time when geoeconomic competition between the global powers is fully on in Southeast Asia. Uh, the big powers in the wider region, they're all competing for influence in uh, various ways. Uh, this is not just for their uh, wider geopolitical objectives, uh, but also to gain access to this uh, exciting ASEAN region. 625 million people, an economy of more than $2 trillion. Uh, this morning, we have a really high-powered panel. Uh, to my left, I have uh, the minister from Thailand, Minister for Trade, uh, Apiradi. Thank you. Uh, Chu Feng from uh, Nanjing University, an expert on uh, U.S.-China relations. Uh, Calvin Chi, China Minsheng Investment. Uh, my minister, Giorgio, uh, so experienced in this field. He was minister for trade when a lot of the initiatives you see in motion were initially thought of. Then he was foreign minister. And now he is a He's in business, so he's on the other side of the fence, so to speak. So he has a ground-up view of uh, what the region is about. And uh, Dato Sri Mustafa, uh, it was my uh, great privilege to meet him many years ago uh, when I was in Bloomberg. And uh, we used to go to him to get a clear view of the uh, uh, Malaysian economy uh, told to us in very simple terms. Uh, we're going to do this uh, clockwise. Each of our speakers is going to get about three to four minutes to uh, present their case. Uh, after that, uh, uh, I'll try to open this to uh, discussion as early as possible, so uh, as many of you can come up with your questions and put them. Uh, one rule I'd like to suggest is that when you frame your questions, you put them, uh, you just keep it simple and not make it too complicated. Uh, many years ago, I was in a press conference with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, and uh, the journalist asked a really long, long-winded question, and he said, uh, thank you for your discourse. So, we, we, you know, we'll avoid the discourse, we just keep questions simple. And the best way to get your responses is to ask a single question, because typically, uh, my experience with newsmakers is that if you ask them two or three questions, they'll pick the one that's most convenient to them and answer that. Uh, so, Minister, would you like to go first? Uh, you have three to four minutes to... Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for your introduction. I feel very privileged to be sitting among the panelists who are very well aware of these issues. And, of course, Minister Joshio, I have been working with him since I was a junior officer. So I'm very privileged to be sitting on the same panel this morning on this issue of this uh, geopolitics, it is very important. We living in an interconnected world. We cannot uh, separate ourselves from, from the world. So all this, uh, we, and we are in the proximity with China, great power, and of course, uh, US after the completion of the TPP, we, have, we really feel the impact of this uh, battering over uh, who will win over, in, especially in the ASEAN, after we complete the AEC. So there is a lot of uh, discussions going on in Thailand about this uh, uh, movement. Of course, we are not part of the TPP, but we are a strong member in ASEAN, and uh, we are working with the uh, web of FTA that ASEAN is working with their uh, trade partners. So I think that uh, first I would like to say, to uh, discuss on how TPP impact on Thailand especially. Uh, there were discussions uh, whether uh, uh, TPP will impact on our competitiveness or not. But uh, we see that, uh, of course, uh, there are plus side 
and uh, minor side of the TPP on Thailand, but uh, we cannot uh, just say that uh, we are outside because uh, as ASEAN, we are a big uh, economic uh, group in itself already, and four of our friends in ASEAN is member of the TPP. So how do we integrate this? Uh, we had an ASEAN discussion on TPP, and uh, I think one very important uh, analysis is that if we are working on the RCEP while we have the TPP, we have to move up our uh, uh, ambition on the RCEP. We cannot leave RCEP as you know, far apart from TPP. Of course, in RCEP, we cannot uh, reach the, the standard of TPP is a very high standard agreement and it cover broader than trade, it cover other issues. But uh, uh, for RCEP, we, we need to benchmark ourselves with TPP so that uh, ASEAN and uh, her uh, trading partners will not be left behind and uh, to, to make ASEAN and her uh, FTA partners uh, meaningful in the in international trade. So I think that, of course, uh, this uh, geopolitics play a very important role to Thailand and to ASEAN uh, in terms of uh, trade as we are moving on. Mm -hmm. uh, when we are talking about this geopolitics and the uh, uh, influence of uh, be it China, Japan, or the US, or the EU. Uh, people are looking at Thailand because we are in the very a very important uh, transformation process. We are in uh, this government. Uh, of course, we are not uh, diplomat the democratic uh, elected government, but we are in the middle of the transformation. Uh, we came and uh, we we uh, up set up a roadmap for the election. We will be, we just complete our, the draft of the constitution and we uh, set up the referendum in August 7. If that goes well, if the constitution were accepted by the people, then the election will be set uh, as put up in the roadmap in the, <coughs> middle of next year, in June probably, and then the new elected government uh, will come in place. But what this constitution is uh, aimed for, we are aiming to have a new government, a strong elected government, uh, with the, first of all, must be a uh, accountable government uh, with good governance, and uh, strong that uh, can, can lead Thailand into the next uh, stage. Uh, Thailand is the, the present government is set up Thailand uh, to move up into Thailand 4.0. We have um, uh, graduating, uh, gradually uh, uh, upgrade ourselves from agriculture-based economy into the export-led economy. And then uh, now I think this is a time for new technology, the, the new uh, road for uh, integration in the international arena. So I think that uh, we are moving up to become a uh, smart farmer, smart uh, consumers uh, country, to be a stronger country uh, in, in, in the near future. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, we set up a, a very uh, a strong base for Thailand to move into the knowledge-based economy. Of course, we are not leaving our agriculture base, but it will be knowledge agriculture economy. So I think that this is uh, uh, how Thailand is transforming itself and that uh, how we uh, will uh, uh, react to the geopolitic uh, uh, movement uh, around the world. Uh, in the, of course, China is very important, uh, uh, neighboring countries with us. ASEAN is the most important uh, power that will push Thailand ahead into this integration. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I talked to Minister Joshua before uh, coming in uh, to this room that uh, we are talking about logistics in ASEAN. Once uh, we have uh, complete this uh, integration, uh, the logistics, uh, is very important. We are building up the connectivity of ASEAN, not only in ASEAN, but to our neighboring countries, like uh, from Singapore 
pass through Thailand to uh, Laos and Yunnan, that is the south of China. And the next more important road is uh, from Thailand through Myanmar to India. So this will be a very important connection <coughs> route uh, that is, will be part of this one belt, one road of uh, China. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I ask you, as a policymaker, you've been in ASEAN councils, uh, you were at WTO, uh, and now you're the minister. Uh, do you sense uh, or do you see a bit of backsliding on the ASEAN economic community? Because uh, it started out by talking about a single market and production base. Mm -hmm. But uh, now the new language coming out is uh, uh, we just talk about uh, a highly integrated economy without talking about a single market and production base. So uh, am I correct in sensing that uh, there is a, a mild... Uh, sense of uh, skepticism that's creeping in uh, within the ASEAN project. What do you see from Thailand? I think the production base is already there for ASEAN. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we need to work further. Yeah. We, you may think that the, the uh, border trade, the non-tariff barriers between the <coughs> ASEAN countries remains, and that uh, might uh, be the one the factor that hinders the mm -hmm. being one production base. But I think that <coughs> is what we are doing and uh, some we have uh, completed uh, those uh, ambition already. And uh, I think I see in your document you talk about the mainland ASEAN and the maritime ASEAN. Mm -hmm. I think especially in the mainland ASEAN, mm -hmm. like in Thailand we also have, we, we have our working relationships with our neighboring countries. Uh, many of the production parts that are in Thailand uh, we Commission to, to we work with our neighboring countries, especially in textile and clothing. Textile is not uh, viable in Thailand anymore, but right. clothing may be. So we are move a lot of uh, production to our neighboring countries, and right. uh, we are, you know, right. uh, working. Well, so this session is really about geoeconomics, and you had the uh, president of the United States in the region recently. He's made major diplomatic moves mm -hmm. towards the left of you in uh, Vietnam and to the right of you in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. uh, you're the only treaty ally of the United States uh, in that part. Uh, are you feeling a bit left out of the action? No, I do not think politics uh, aside, but I think on business terms, uh, we are working very well, very closely with the US. With the United States? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Chu Feng, uh, would you, you have the floor. Yeah, I, I think from China's perspective, uh, uh, geoeconomic surroundings has never been more tricky. Right. Two reasons. One is uh, in the past uh, uh, three decades, uh, we enjoy a lot of uh, uh, friendly and mostly positive uh, geoeconomic surroundings to China. That kind of like, good interactions, not just in terms of uh, geoeconomy, truly is um, help a lot for China to to advance ourselves commercially, economically, socially. But the problem is China now is getting bigger. So then uh, I see some sort of a skeptics, also just uh, uh, equally uh, searching about what kind of a China uh, will, will, will on the horizon or will be there. But anyway, we see, uh, I think, the leading change uh, from the uh, past three decades, China become a bigger elephant sitting at the sitting room of all the regional members. So then, then I think the consequences, there's a growing uh, awareness, we say, uh, the region is watchful to what kind of China uh, will be. Then another one is the like, Americans' uh, strategic reaction. Rebalancing strategies, the combination between geopolitics uh, and the geo-economy. Uh, so then China is not number one trading power to the most of the regional players. China is the number one uh, trading uh, country in the world. But China is excluded from uh, the TPP process. Then the Beijing shows some sort of uh, enthusiasm in joining the TPP, but we don't know how high the bar will be raised for China to enter into the TPP. Then we also see some sort of a spillover effects from the TPP process. For example, the White House always emphasized the TPP is a struggle for, for what? For norm making. So U.S. will not leave the way, for, uh, give the way to China uh, to write the future's uh, trading norms. 
But where else is he such a, a, a rhetoric? It's not just the geoeconomic, it's, it's also geopolitical. So then, uh, conclusively, we also see uh, two things probably will be uh, equally paramount for the Chinese futures groups. One is how friendly and positive the geoeconomic surroundings in Asia Pacific remain for China's growth. Then, second is how the power uh, competition will not just, uh, how to say, uh, very negatively and uh, adversely affect the in economic integration and the economic interactions. Hypothetically, we say uh, uh, growing uh, interdependence will uh, modify the geopolitical uh, competition, but I'm a professor of international relations. I'm very skeptical of this. Mm -hmm. Feng, uh, you know, China has been very successful in playing by the rules when it comes to WTO. Uh, you uh, mastered the use of the dispute settlement mechanism mm -hmm. in WTO. Why is it that when it comes to the South China Sea, you are so reluctant to play by the rules that uh, the region? Uh, Good question. Uh, <coughs> uh, um, two things, I think. We couldn't see some sort of a, such an uh, interesting comparison. One is South China Sea is definitely concerning the sovereignty and some sort of a political, you know, the uh, enthusiasm and nationalistic passion. So then it could be just uh, how say easily comparable. So WTO is relatively uh, less, uh, sens less sensitive with uh, some sort of economic issues. But if we turn on to the sovereignty issue, it's overwhelmingly sensitive in the uh, domestic political context. So then South China Sea issue, I think we also see the escalation tension. It seemed to me it's driven by two things. One is some sort of uh, domestic nationalism. It's very important. And such a nationalism also overdrowning the <coughs> policy narrative. But the other is some sort of a growing uh, geopolitical competition. So Beijing just uh, believe uh, land reclamation is, is what we, we have done in the territory belonging to China. So then it's well not just a leader to the full uh, militarization. But of course, it also caused the Americans uh, overreaction. So then, sensibly, we have to find a way to get things just ease down. Thank you. Thank you. Calvin? Hi. Um, first of all, you know, it's my great honor to be here today to uh, speak with all these, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, honorable uh, guests today. Um, so uh, from my end, you know, I, um, it's good that I speak after Professor Ju, uh, because, you know, from um, China Mission Investment, uh, we are a non-state-owned uh, investment company. We are the largest China-named um, investment company uh, in China, uh, not owned by the government, but approved to be set up specially by the state council. Uh, so I'll talk more from the business side. Uh, but from uh, my perspective, right, doing investment globally, uh, CMI, you know, our mission is to invest along the Belt and Road, um, invest globally uh, into companies, technologies, uh, interesting opportunities globally along the um, uh, Belt and Road, but again, you know, growing global and also bringing back into China. So it's really about world connectivity. So, but if you talk about world connectivity, geopolitical um, topics is something that we cannot disregard. So I was uh, on the flight, uh, flying to, um, uh, you know, KL to attend this conference. You know, I saw on the Times Magazine uh, front, front cover, they talk about the, um, uh, the South China Sea. So on the, on the front page, they talk about the Nansan, uh, island, talk about it's, um, you know, it's 0 0.05 square kilometers, right. piece of small land, right. uh, but you know, four countries claim for it. So it's really interesting to know that, but then uh, on overall basis, I think from investment angle, uh, I think sovereign risk or geographical risk, I think it's just one of the risks that we need to bear in mind. Overall, I think we look for opportunities. So I think um, uh, in terms of ASEAN, countries, you know, from a CMI perspective, from, from a, as an investor perspective, I think it's a, it's a, it's a one um, big, uh, you know, um, integrated um, uh, economy um, that we cannot disregard. It's big in terms of opportunities, it's, it's big in terms of the uh, labor force. I think um, probably, I think uh, all of you know that it's actually, uh, the Asian country is actually the third largest labor force in the world uh, after China and India. So I think, you know, from CMI, we want to focus on uh, putting capital into opportunities uh, in Asian countries, but also um, putting more long-term seed investment. 
uh, also into the country in terms of developing the country. So we set up together with, uh, uh, maybe next time also in future, together with uh, you know, Professor Chu University, but right now um, we uh, collaborate with uh, the Tsinghua University together with, uh, you know, we announced a, a, a human, uh, you know, a talent cultivation fund. Uh, we announced it in, um, in, the, in China, uh, but we, we want to launch it first in Indonesia, uh, but maybe gradually, you know, spreading across other ASEAN countries as well. Uh, you know, it's over a 10 years period, because we, from what we look at it, you know, from CMI, uh, we don't work ourselves as a fund. You know, maybe just a bit of um, a little bit of background. You know, we pull up. Uh, it's really a pooling of resources and capital. Mm. So we pull up 61 uh, leading private enterprises in China. Um, they are all, you know, leading and uh, with uh, specific strengths uh, uh, in terms of capital and also their uh, achievements in the respective sector. But uh, again, you know, all the perfect capital um, together, uh, investing offshore. So I think there are lots of uh, opportunities that we can connect. Uh, you know, from this group uh, with the ASEAN countries. Um, so I think we also announced that uh, we want to invest into Asian countries, uh, you know, industrial parks, connecting you know, what we talk about, the overcapacity uh, of resources in China uh, into the uh, Asian countries. Mm. So it's pretty much a win-win situation. Mm. But again, we also looked at that, again, we talk about the geopoliticals you know, as a topic today. This is something that we are always you know, need to pay more awareness and attention. And um, you know, uh, again, you know, the TPP. You know, we talk about it. You know, lifting out China, but then we also have other, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, multilateral funding like the AIIB, uh, like the uh, Silk Road Fund. Again, you know, there, there could be participation point by private capital. Uh, so from CMI, you know, we are purely private capital, but again, we embrace uh, you know all these opportunities in Asian countries. Uh, so I think you know this is something that uh, probably the world has you know not yet starting to think about because it's less uh, political. Uh, you know, from private capital standpoint, you know, either institutional side or either, you know, even from private pockets, you know, family office fund. So I was um, uh, featured as one of the, uh, you know, um, uh, my honor to be speaking at the, uh, the UBS uh, Global Summit uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, they also have a topic on uh, uh, Belt and Road. Um, but then we also talk about, you know, exploring opportunities for investment uh, by private capital, but then the family pockets, right? Uh, all these people, you know, they are probably, uh, you know, looking for balancing of portfolios. So they might invest into the short-term projects, but also, you know, for ASEAN country projects, maybe longer terms, right? But uh, again, you know, th this could be one of the interesting uh, element that they, they would uh, watch for. But uh, just to sum up, right, you know, um, from, from our end, you know, ASEAN countries um, pose significant opportunities. You know, it, it's a market that we cannot disregard as every investor. Um, um, we, we want to invest not in terms of capital, but as, as we said, we want to invest to develop the, the soft side, the human talents, technologies, and other aspects. Um, you know, um, we see significant opportunities because we know that there are significant funding gap, huge funding gap. So not a funding gap that can be fulfilled by any of the, just the sovereign pockets. So there could be opportunities, significant opportunities for the private capital. And, uh, but then, you know, be, given all this, you know, um, um, overlapping rules, you know, TVP, all the different ones, you know, that you see in the market, some of those are actually overlapping. So we do think that, you know, you need uh, some kind of like, um, you know, monetary mechanism. So I saw one of the reports talking about ASEAN country integration, uh, but it seems that there have been big gap in terms of how the government sees it. They sees it, you know, it's, for example, um, 90% integration fulfillment, right? But then some of the private, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, side of uh, interviewing, they said that is huge gap. So we probably need more, um, you know, independent type of monetary mechanism just to kind of like promote, again, the continued integration. But last but not least, I think it's more about the connectivity mm. and uh, also about momentum. So as long as you have the momentum in the countries, mm. then I think, you know, all these opportunities mm. from the economic side can contain all the geopolitical um, issues. Mm. I mean, um you know, as a banker and financier, yeah. uh, do you see political risk rising in the region? Now, what is your big worry? Uh, as I said, right, you know, I think political risk is always, you know, uh, one of the pocket or checkbox that you need to consider. Um, in terms of the world right now, I think it's getting more interesting. Um, politically, issues may be more. Uh, only because that the world is getting more connected. Hmm. So when you connected the world, right, when you connect the world, then you have lots of things to deal with, not only the political side, hmm. but in terms of cultural, 
in terms of you know the 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 um, the, the, the people the beliefs you know in terms of the um, also the differences or gaps in terms of the wealth. So I think this is um, a process that you cannot disregard. Right. But I think we should just embrace it. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of uh, as an investor, mm -hmm. uh, we don't see this as something that particularly as a red alert. Mm -hmm. um, so, but then we want to embrace more in terms of um, in the stage of um, change, right? Uh, you know, where are the opportunities? Right. I mean, that's very comforting to hear that it's <laughs> not uh, a red alert situation. Uh, and thank you for that. May I ask you, you know, this entire uh, policy of uh, one belt, one road is predicated on Chinese surpluses. <clears throat> of which uh, you know, we know that uh, huge uh, reserves in uh, China. But in the last year, if, uh, you know, uh, if what the reports say is accurate, the country has burned through a trillion dollars uh, trying to uh, shore up its stocks, uh, protect its currency. Do you see risk that uh, that could impact on the funds available for uh, OBOR and other initiatives? No, I think um, in terms of the uh, stock market, I think maybe Professor Jiu can also chip in. I think it's also a process that China's financial markets getting more connected with the world. Mm. So I think it's just a, pretty much like a test pilot or like a procedure process that you need to get through anyway. Because previously, I think the China market, very differently from the, the international market, is more retail driven market versus I think the world is, is really very institutional investor driven. Mm -hmm. So I think from our standpoint, I think we uh, think that the better way to look at it is that we need to promote the, the, uh, the balancing size of the different pockets, right? As I said, right, you know, not only the sovereign pockets, the institutional pockets, the private pockets, we need to see a more well-balanced participation by the different capital side. Mm -hmm. And I think even for China, I think uh, right now, you know, we have been trying to formulate uh, from CMI standpoint, uh, a sp specific alliance, right? not, pro not for profit nature, uh, Asia Institutional Investor Alliance, trying to pull up all the sovereign institutional players, but also the private pocket side, mm. try to um, you know, make more attention focuses uh, to promote the orderly developments and also the, the changes uh, in some of the mechanism uh, uh, to um, have an orderly market. Mm. So I think these are the steps that I think you know, is unnecessary. Mm. Uh, but then, you know, again, right, we don't see any particular yeah. um, you know, um, a big problem in terms of like burning up capital, uh, you know, overly surplus, um, you know, uh, uh, not anymore. You know, I think, we, again, we see, um, uh, you know, we are quite bullish in terms of, you know, the, around the country's connectivity with the Asian world, uh, you know, and uh, we would love to, uh, you know, uh, invest more. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Calvin, for that. Before I request uh, Minister Giorgio to give us his views, could I request the audience that in case uh, you have questions coming up, you might like to formulate them in your mind or maybe even write it down for yourself for clarity. Uh, Minister, you're known as the big picture person. Would you give us the big picture on what's happening in this region? If I can take on the last point uh, from Kelvin about uh, One Belt, One Road. I think it's only partly motivated by excess capacity in China. Hmm. Uh, China is growing organically, and China is feeling its own strength. At any point you cross into China, in the past it used to be you move from a more developed region into a less developed region. But today, is, it is the exact opposite. Whether it is uh, at the North Korean border, the Russian border, the Kazakh border, the Myanmar border, or the Vietnamese border, infrastructure on the Chinese side uh, is much better developed. So it's almost as if the water pressure is building up, only waiting to spill into <laughs> its neighbors. <laughs> And this is the logic of China's economic development, that uh, whether or not we call it one belt, one road, uh, China will be integrating its neighbors right. uh, in ever-widening circles because of the sheer size and uh, dynamism uh, of its economy. Uh, it will, of course, choose the line of least resistance, that where a neighbor is friendly, feels self-confident, then it will be quickly energized. And one belt, one road is a way of funneling this, this flow uh, so that it's not only economic, it is also political and cultural. And this is Chinese statecraft, which we are not seeing for the first time in history. In fact, it's been repeated every time there is a dynastic ascent uh, in China. And this is the, the, the deep logic. And in ASEAN, all the countries uh, sense it. Uh, no one wants China to be an enemy because there's too much to be lost. 
But because no one wants China to be an enemy, everyone wants America and Japan to be a friend. Because if you plug into China, it's so big, you are afraid that it may become too dependent. So you want diversification. And I believe China understands this. Uh, years ago, when uh, Premier Zhu Rongji proposed a, proposed a free trade agreement between China and Southeast Asia, two years later in Phnom Penh, there was a framework agreement. And I remember what he said. Somehow it was not recorded. But he said China does not seek for itself an exclusive position in Southeast Asia. You take, say, China-Vietnam relations. The more Vietnam wants closer links to China, the more we must expect Vietnam to want closer links to America and to Japan. And this logic applies to every country on China's border. So I think we should take a relaxed view about this. Mm. The South China Sea, of course, is an area of contest. It's partly a trial of strength between the US and China, which we must expect for years to come. But they play a very big chessboard, which includes the Middle East, Russia, the US dollar. So I think both sides will, in the end, be rational. The key is ASEAN unity. If, if we maintain solidarity and work calculate in our own collective interests, I think we will know how to play this game. I tell my American friends, I tell my Vietnamese friends, if the US were not in the region, the countries in ASEAN will have a weak negotiating position. However, if the US were too close, instead of we making use of the US, we are just pawns on the larger chess board. So if the US comes too close, everybody becomes very nervous. And there is a sweet spot, which is what diplomacy and statecraft should try to find. The US seen on the radar plot, but not within visual range. I think that is a sweet spot. And, <laughs> and I say this to my friends in the Vietnamese foreign ministry. I say this to my Chinese friends. I say this to my American <clears throat> friends. And this is really what ASEAN is trying to do. Have the US around, but don't get it too involved. Because if it gets too involved, it becomes messy. And instead of the game being under our control, we lose control of the game. Right. All this talk about RCEP, TPP, they are important. But they are not that important. They are not life and death. The reason is simple. It's just one more club to join. And all of us have already so many club memberships. <laughs> so when we talk about economic architecture, we're not talking about an organizational chart. We're talking about a neural network, you know? Mm. And everybody has got a diversity of links. And the more links you have, the more energy you get. The key for us in ASEAN is to maintain a high degree of solidarity so that whenever there's a new club, it's always open to ASEAN members. Better to ASEAN as a whole. It's like a reciprocal membership, you know? You, you join ASEAN, you join all the clubs. So in this way, if you look at the neural network, there is a great density of links passing through ASEAN. And this is what ASEAN diplomacy consists of, which is neutral, friendly to everybody, full access to all our major partners. You come here, you follow certain rules of good behavior, we welcome you as a partner, and we interact, and it benefits all of us. The key is not the economic arrangements. The key is our own internal strength. Every country, do we carry out economic reforms? Do we educate our people? If we do, everyone will want us as a club member, and ASEAN collectively. Of course, we have a role to play to make sure that the big powers, when they are uh, in rivalry, that we manage their rivalries. In fact, ASEAN plays their rivalries. You know, China is financing the North-South links in ASEAN. That's good for ASEAN. Japan is anxious to finance the East-West links. That's good for ASEAN. And if we get both working with us, we get a nice grid. India is also pushing as uh, Minister Apiradi said, through Myanmar. Myanmar is now the last piece slotted into the regional jigsaw. So we're talking about trucking between India and Southeast Asia, trucking between China and Southeast Asia. And if you cast our eyes 10, 20 years downstream, Southeast Asia will link China and India. And while now the important relationship is that between the US and China, further down, 
this century, links between China and India will be very important. And ASEAN has got to manage all these big powers in a skillful way. So, so long as we are ASEAN-centric in all these regional trade maneuvers, I think we'll be okay. So, so far, ASEAN has sort of managed to maintain its centrality. Um, do you think uh, it could be uh, pushed out? Uh, because really, do you need uh, ASEAN to play a mediating role between India and China? They have so much civilizational con uh, contacts going back for centuries. That's interesting. I, I was just in Peking University. Uh, the Indian president was on an official visit to China. Yeah. And when he was there, he gave a lecture and witnessed a series of agreements signed between uh, Indian universities and Chinese universities. I'm the chancellor of Nalanda University, right. which was the university which the old Tang Dynasty monk, Xuanzang, <coughs> went to. So I signed on the behalf of India. <laughs> and I was watching the interaction between Indian university presidents and Chinese Indian university presidents. And I noticed that it's, it's not a natural relationship. It's a bit like oil and water. That you require a bit of softness I see. to bring them together. Mm -hmm. And we provide in Southeast Asia the best softener yeah. between India and China. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Minister. <clears throat> Minister, Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Ravi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, after those uh, very insightful comments from Josh, let me add on to this uh, audience the Malaysian story. Uh, we start off by being close to the Europeans, of course. Our natural allies, you know, we were colonized by uh, the UK and became independent, and that was our first. Uh, first stop in terms of uh, you know, uh, economic and foreign relations. And then we became more and more diversified, uh, focused on Asia, ASEAN, very much uh, central to our scheme of things, and of course America uh, now uh, coming to the region. So that's the evolution. Yeah? Europe, European-centric, uh, Asian-centric, uh, some American influence, and now very much ASEAN-centric. So our focus, I mean, for many of us in ASEAN, as mentioned by Mr. Paradi and also Josh, uh, you know, ASEAN is central, is very important to us. That's point number one. Point number two, this issue of linkages that Josh spoke about, yeah? We are part of the world. We, I mean, we can't survive on our own. So that has been a centerpiece of our policy, developing economic linkages. Uh, there's a lot of economic uh, content in our foreign policy, of course, a lot of linkages. And the bottom line is, is incomes, jobs, inclusion, quality of life uh, for all of us. I'm talking about as Malaysia, we want to be a developed nation. So we want to push on you know, uh, this, uh, this, this agenda uh, by linking up with the world. It is in that context that we sign FTAs. Uh, I know that Thailand, Singapore, and many others are doing that, but uh, We've been open all this while. Uh, you look at Malacca 700 years ago, one of the biggest trading centers in the world. Yeah? And we believe uh, that's coming back. I mean, ASEAN, Malaysia being you know, very strategically located, ASEAN. So our policy has been open in terms of investments, in terms of trade. Uh, at the same time, we consider ourselves to be moderate. Yeah? Uh, these issues in the China, South China Sea uh, and many other issues in the world. We have taken the, the middle ground. That does, does not mean we're weak, but we believe uh, that's the best, best way forward. Uh, linking with the world. Uh, when you talk about TPP, for example, uh, one major motivation was to link up with the American market. We've been uh, struggling for quite a while to get a bilateral with, uh, with the US, and there was this opportunity, so you know, we thought this, this was a wonderful opportunity. And besides that, there's Canada, Mexico, and Peru. We haven't got FTAs uh, with those countries. So that's how we look at things. We have been an open economy all this while. We, are, we believe we're one of the uh, major beneficiaries of, of WTO, an open trading regime. Uh, we're open to investments. Uh, tourism is important to us. In Thailand, Singapore, I mean, ASEAN, yeah, tourism is important. So we, we, I mean, the bottom line, as I say, is incomes, jobs, quality of life. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, and uh, that's, the, that's our agenda. And that, that's the agenda of many of us. Therefore, how do we uh, maximize, you know? I mean, in the context of this agenda of being a developed nation, 
improving the quality of life of people. How do we, how do we link up with the world yeah, through free, free, trade agreements? So our, our approach has been uh, to uh, be friends with Asia, China, Japan. We have the Look East policy, for example, yeah, which is still quite strong. Uh, China, we've been close to China. Uh, America, there's been, you know, uh, a lot of changes uh, in terms of bilateral relations. ASEAN, of course, is, is central. There was a time when we were at odds with our friends in the South, Singapore. Yeah? Uh, but uh, in the last seven, eight years, six, seven years, we've seen a, a gradual warming up. And it's important to have good neighbors. I mean, it's important to, uh, to be close to our neighbors. And for that reason, you know, we, we have gone out of the way, I must say, with Thailand, Singapore, Brunei, Indonesia. Uh, peace, stability is so important for the region because the bottom line for us is incomes, jobs, growth, inclusion, quality of life. And for that reason, we have a very, uh, you know, uh, a policy uh, which has linked up uh, Malaysia with, with the rest of the world through our foreign policy and through our economic policy. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I'm uh, ready now to take questions. Uh, who would like to ask the first question? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, would you is, identify yourself yes, sure. by name my and affiliation? Yeah, my name is Mark De Smith from Point 72 Asset Management. Just want to pick up on a couple of the last points. Um, I think because Brigadier Yo made a point about um, keeping America on the radar, but but uh, not visually. And if we extend that metaphor to uh, China's reach into the uh, South China Sea where there's now a growing physical presence. Is that still the right approach to take um, as China reaches more and more into uh, this region? That question's for you. Uh, this, this is a complex area. I don't think we have time to go into it in detail. Uh, when I was foreign minister, I, I made it my business to study all the claims in detail even though Singapore itself had no skin in the game, except for freedom of navigation. But it was important that when we are fashioning an ASEAN consensus, we understand uh, why people feel strongly about certain things. The point I want to make is China's claims are not weak. China's claims uh, antedate all the other claims, going back to Qing Dynasty. And um, when China drew its nine dash lines, the predecessor countries of uh, today's Southeast Asian countries, uh, meaning the US, uh, France, France did, say, uh, uh, Britain, uh, uh, did not object. Uh, when, the, when the Japanese occupied those islands as part of the invasion of China uh, in 1937, uh, there was no protest from the other countries, which were not yet at war with China. So I'm not saying that China is right, because if I were a Malaysian or Bruneian or Filipino, it seems to me quite egregious that China's nine dash line should come right up to my horizon. So I can understand the, the, the force of feelings uh, on the part of Southeast Asian countries, but it would be a serious mistake to underestimate uh, the legality of China's claims and therefore to underestimate their will uh, not to give it up. Thank you, Minister. Um, may I ask a question to the three panelists from ASEAN? Uh, if you look at uh, uh, trade statistics, uh, exports are weak. Uh, true that the global picture is not very good, but one reason is that the big economies that surround this region, you know, China, India, and Indonesia up to a point, they're all lengthening their supply chains. They want to get more done at home. Uh, and uh, what does this imply for the region, you know, especially when a country like uh, Indonesia, which should lead ASEAN, uh, insists that more be done there and uh, puts, uh, you know, uh, barriers in the way of uh, uh, trade that could impact the second largest economy in ASEAN, for instance, into, you know, sending your auto exports into, uh, into Indonesia. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to respond to that? Yes. I think uh, if you look at the campaign around the world, mm -hmm. all the coming up uh, leaders are talking about their own domestic issue, they want everything done in their own country. But I do not think that in this interlinkages economy, that can be done mm -hmm. economically. Okay. Otherwise, you will be very expensive production. Okay. So I think that uh, we have moved along 
and uh, we cannot turn back the tide. That's very reassuring. So I think that uh, we need to do all this uh, outsourcing or whatever to make our production competitive, even in agriculture. Right. You, you cannot do everything alone in, in your own country. Would you agree, Dr. Sri? Yeah, we have to stay the course. And we have set ourselves a target uh, to be, uh, you made reference, Ravi, to the single uh, production base, uh, a more integrated, cohesive ASEAN. We've got to stay the course. I mean, there's a clear vision for the future, 2016, 2025. It's all set up. Uh, so, you know, we, we have to move in that direction. Uh, we have to demonstrate our will and commitment uh, to get there. Uh, besides that, of course, uh, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot more intra-ASEAN investments and trade. Uh, and we believe going forward, the numbers will go up. Of course, China is important. Europe, America, important trading and investment partners. But uh, from my point of view, I, I, I think there's going to be a lot more interest and investments. And that will bring us uh, much closer to, an, to another. And that will promote uh, closer economic integration. So in a way, there'll be more, uh, well, uh, domestic, I mean, or regional sources of growth yeah, going forward. In the next 10 years, 2025, I see ASEAN being more integrated and ASEAN will be more cohesive, uh, more vibrant, more dynamic. There'll be a lot more uh, sources of growth coming from the region. And now it's true, China uh, is big and U.S. to some extent and, and America. But 2025, I've ever reason to believe that we're going to stay the cost, number one. And number two, we're going to be more closely integrated and there will be a lot more uh, domestic or regional sources of growth. Having said that, of course, I agree with Josh. I mean, we've got to put our own houses in order. That, that's very important. That's, that's a very important prerequisite. I mean, before we move to regional level, We've got to make sure that we are in good shape. Thank Individually, you. you're in good shape. Thank you. Minister? I'm optimistic uh, for Southeast Asia. Uh, the, the reason is because coastal China has become expensive and de-industrializing. Near Hong Kong, there are two cities which are neighbors, Tongkwan and Shenzhen. Tongkwan was a major manufacturing hub for the world 10 years ago. Today, Tongkwan is virtually a wasteland because the factories have moved out. Shenzhen, which is where you have the headquarters of Tencent and Huawei and they make drones and everything else, is the economy of China's future. Tongkwan has moved to Southeast Asia. And in logistics, we've been sensing this for years now, a flow of factories mm -hmm. into Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia. Countries that are ready to receive them will receive them. Of course, we too must upgrade, and we do not want to be stuck where Tongkwan is now stuck. But it is a very good intermediate step. You will see us through for the next 10, 20 years, the industrialization of Southeast Asia, which will become a major factory of the world. Mm. Uh, Vietnam, for example, has uh, been receiving billions of dollars of manufacturing investments mm. in electronics and other areas in the last few years. Yeah. Samsung expects to have more investments in Vietnam than in all of China. Absolutely. In fact, the, uh, I think it's $10 billion or something Samsung exports from... So the key uh, is logistics. Yeah. If you can reduce logistics costs right. and simplify uh, business, the investments will come. Thank you, Minister. Any, any more questions from the floor, please? Anybody? Uh, Minister Mustafa, may I ask you, sir? You were the first country in ASEAN to recognize China in 1974, if I'm not mistaken. Um, lately, uh, your defense ministry has been showing its, uh, flagging its worries about uh, Chinese fishing boats in your exclusive economic zone. Uh, but at the same time, the Chinese are investing, uh, also co-investing with you in uh, projects like, you know, that's done by one MDB and all that. How do you play uh, this contradiction uh, in, in your government? You know, at one level you need the Chinese, at another level you feel you're being needled by them in so many ways. How do you, how do, you do your policies when, it, uh, when you're faced with a situation like this? Indeed, well, we started, I mean, the first ASEAN country to recognize uh, China in 1974, and that's a very uh, important point for both uh, Malaysia and China. And we believe, uh, uh, I mean, this is, Constructive diplomacy, mm -hmm. yeah, um, uh, and being very uh, pragmatic. Right. Uh, on one hand, you have uh, China 
having this claim, you know, in the South China Sea. Uh, George has got his views on this. Uh, mm. We've heard you loud and clear, and China, China's got a view. So Malaysia, uh, we've been constructive. Uh, life has got to move on. Mm. Yeah, we cannot be uh, we cannot be you know dragged into this uh, uh, this very important subject, of course. Uh, you know, but uh, life has got to move. Economic has got to you know, the economic uh, progress mm. has got to uh, continue. So in in that context. Uh, Yes, in the last four or five years, there have been uh, a big increase in investments. Trade has always been number one for five, six years. But investments, uh, China has never been strong in Malaysia in investments. They've been strong in construction. They've been winning lots of projects, uh, uh, hydro and power plants, uh, uh, road construction. But in invest long-term fixed investments, China has never been big. In the last three, four years, they've kind of big. Win. So uh, for us, as I say, economics is important. Uh, the bottom line is income, peace, stability, quality of life, and we've been able to be constructive mm -hmm. uh, in this whole thing, and we believe uh, that's the best policy for Malaysia. It's a, it's a small uh, country which is uh, in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, between we have India, we have China. We have not spoken too much about India, unfortunately, but India is another, 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 another country that, that's becoming important. So in a way, that will, I mean, if people are worried about China being too, too, too big, uh, there's India coming up, and India is very bullish and very aggressive. So that's another, an, an, another, another economic uh, giant that we, we got to uh, deal with. Mm -hmm. Any questions, anybody? From any? uh, in, in that case, I'll ask one more question. Do you think this whole emphasis on the importance of China to the regional economy is a bit overemphasized in the sense that it's not really a one-way relationship? I think the Chinese also should uh, be aware that uh, this region is important to them. If you look at uh, investment statistics, for instance, uh, it's Singapore that is the number one investor in China for the last three years. Do you think uh, this, uh, uh, you know, this relationship is a bit uh, uh, one-sided in the way it's talked about? Do you think it, there should be a more uh, uh, narrative that speaks about a more, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 cooperative uh, um, relationship minister i think that uh, i think china know all this uh, uh, interplay you know, uh, between china and asean and i think they they try to be uh, you know part of asean in many ways as minister you said uh, investment of china in uh, thailand uh, for example on this uh, uh, rail rail link yeah, from China to ASEAN, and uh, I think they try to be more cooperative. We have been discussing them on terms of investment, and uh, I think <coughs> they know that uh, they have to be present in ASEAN, and uh, they try to be more cooperative. So I think that uh, China has uh, played uh, this game with ASEAN for some time. Uh, unlike India, they are new in this ASEAN game. But I think that we need to in, in involve more India into this uh, scene, uh, China, ASEAN, India, because it's going to be a very important region if we can link China and ASEAN through India, which we are working on. Mm -hmm. Minister, you know India better than almost anybody else in this room. <laughs> Would you have a comment to that? You know, for my company, Carry Logistics, uh, right now things look flat across the whole region, except India. India remains a bright spot, and a very bright spot, because the Indian economy is on the move. It is organic. Uh, it's sometimes because of government, sometimes despite government, but India is big, and India's population will overtake China in maybe 10, 15 years' time. And the middle classes are growing. If you look at the numbers, uh, last year India made 100 million mobile phones, mostly by Chinese companies. And I was told by the Deputy Indian Finance Minister that India will soon have a billion mobile phones, smartphones. And this will transform the Indian economy. But last year, India sold only about 2 million passenger cars compared to 21 million for China. But you can see the waves coming, one after the other. First, sugar and oil, which are expanding rapidly in India. Then, uh, white goods, uh, and then mobile phones, and eventually be motor cars and other things. So India has still got a long runway ahead. It's got a young population and will become more and more important to Southeast Asia. And it behoves us in Southeast Asia 
to have both India and China as very close friends and neighbors. Mm -hmm. By 2050, China will be the world's biggest, biggest economy by margin. India will either be the second or third largest economy in the world. And we are smack right in between. How can we not do well? Absolutely. Do you agree, Calvin? Absolutely. I think um, India, I think, is a, is a big market. I think, as I said, you know, we look at not only the uh, investment opportunities out of the cooperation, existing one, but also the future potentials, right? So again, you know, India, China, the biggest labor force uh, market in the world, uh, lots of smart people, lots of uh, good companies with potentials. So recently, uh, we invested into a company, um, you know, one of the largest uh, transformers uh, manufacturer um, uh, in the world, uh, but it is a, is a China company called Tiba. Uh, they have uh, big um, uh, plans in, the, in India uh, doing EPC, doing uh, energy and related uh, projects. And in fact, this is also one of the areas, obviously, you know, out of the, um, the, the geopolitics topic, you know, the energy, nationalism, you know, all this, you know, is, is the, the topic that the sovereign, you know, will be looking into, but the same as, you know, for the uh, commercial side of um, uh, investment decision. You know, I think uh, renewable energy, clean energy, you know, is a big space that we uh, look so much into. I think India is also a big market that I think we, we focus on, but not yet spending enough time. Maybe uh, need to spend more time with George first uh, to understand about more about India, but definitely a market that we are uh, we, we, uh, we interested. I see. Thank you. Chu Feng, uh, you're an expert on U.S.-China relationship, but uh, increasingly India is coming in as a third factor in this whole uh, thing. In fact, the talk now is of an Indo-Pacific, which seems to be a new construct <coughs> that's coming up, clearly has geostrategic uh, uh, ramifications. Uh, there, there's an old African saying that, uh, you know, it's a cliche almost that when two elephants uh, fight or do anything else, it's the grass that gets uh, trampled. Uh, the relationship between these two tectonic plates of Asia uh, could affect the uh, region with all its small countries here. Where do you see that relationship going? Yeah, uh, China-India relations, of course, is um, uh, increasingly uh, significant. And could you and frame it in the part in, with the U U.S. in mind as well? Um, yes. Then what we see in the past few years, U.S. would like to courtly India into the American side. Then uh, uh, strategic partnership and security relations with India, of course, now is a very important piece of American uh, Asian Pacific rebalancing strategy. Um, but at last, I think the Chinese feel released about the strategic relations with the New Delhi. The reason is two. One is we are two elephants. Elephant usually is a benign animal. We don't want to fight. Then second is then we will see a geoeconomic wave as a judge very powerfully demonstrate. India and China, we can shake the hand. We can help just the house re Scalping the economic, you know, the uh, skyline in Asia and in the world. So, uh, some, some sort of such a very uh, commercial realism uh, driven, uh, you know, uh, chemistry now is, it seemed to me, uh, falling to the two powers. Mm -hmm. So, economically and socially, we are getting closer. On the other hand, Indo Pacific concept, yes, it's, it's, it's created by the United States, but the problem is. Uh, Chinese should just uh, stay away from some sort of such a, uh, a new uh, conceptualization? No, absolutely not. So then in the uh, Pacific uh, idea, it seemed to me is very, very attractive because first of all, no one can just uh, have to turn back to India. So we also uh, powerfully uh, see the India's uh, bright you know, prospect. China, of course, we needed to pull India in. But the problem is, we couldn't just uh, stop over uh, reconceptualizing the region. We should also make a little, some sort of a preparation for, for giving away to India and letting India sitting in. But now when we talk about the concept of Indochina, uh, but we couldn't see India is not the membership of the APEC. India does not uh, come in into the EAS. Then India also not just a, some sort of a very uh, important member of ARF. So India now is acting east, but the problem is the east is ready to welcome India in. So then my question or my uh, exploration is, if we would like to consistently insist on <coughs> the concept of the Indo-Pacific, we should create the space for New Delhi to move in. But now my question is also uh, not just uh, uh, 
for myself, but also for the, our panelists, the entire Asia Pacific region is well prepared to leave the loom, allow India to play the bigger role. That's our question. Uh, no. Ravi, just one final point. I, yes. yeah. I think it's not just China and India, yes, but ASEAN as well. ASEAN yes. is going to be a very important player going forward 10, 15 years from now. It's not just India. ASEAN is a region, yeah? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, so don't, don't ever forget ASEAN. If I can add uh, to Minister Mustafa's point, you know, I followed carefully the, the visit of the Indian president to China recently. It began with a visit to Guangzhou. It began with the visit to a temple called Hualing Si, the Hualing Temple, where Bodhidharma came from Kerala to China and introduced Chan or Zen Buddhism to China, <laughs> came to, coming through Southeast Asia. The monks that travel between India and China always pass through Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asia, there's a beautiful Malay description of where we live, Tana di Bawa, Tana di Bawa Angin, the land below the winds. Because the trade winds blow in one direction half the year and in the other direction the other half. Absolutely. So they've always met here. And we are the result of years of interaction with both. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, uh, uh, dear panelists, for a really stimulating session. A lot of reassuring messages that have come out. And uh, there's also, uh, if you recall what uh, Minister Giorgio said, that it's not that China doesn't have a case in the South China Sea. So when the uh, arbitration panel rules, I suspect that there might actually be some surprises in store. You know, it may not be what everyone else thinks uh, could happen, you know. Uh, so let's wait and uh, watch for that. Whatever happens there is going to impact on this region. Uh, thank you, uh, ma'am. Thank you, everybody else, for this wonderful session. Thank you.